Welcome to another edition of my office hours, where we're going to focus a bit more on mid-level career questions. If you're new to the channel, welcome. My name is Steve Wynn, Meta, or Scuba Steve, and I'm an L7 software engineer. On this channel, we take a structured and engineering approach to your career in life. If you want your question answered, leave it in the comments section below, or head over to my Discord and post a question in the advice forum. The forum and discussion there are ah, chef's kiss, and it's all for free. I make long form videos, which take a long time to produce. So I just started an email newsletter for topics that aren't quite long enough for a dedicated video. You can find signup information in the description and follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn to get the absolute latest on my thoughts. Let's dive right in. Kamal Chaya asks, was wondering if you could address the concerns that ChatGPT would take over software engineering jobs. Okay, programmers and software engineers have been trying to replace themselves ever since they existed. Programming languages and compilers meant that anybody could give computers commands in plain English. That didn't eliminate programmers. For loops and subroutines allowed us to run pieces of code as many times as we wanted to. Templating and object-oriented code meant that we could get more sophisticated about dispatching runtime behavior. Scripting allowed us to automate terminal actions. I see generative AI as being able to make us that much more efficient with code-level tasks. But really, I wouldn't be looking at ChatGPT for this, but rather things like Copilot, which can be integrated with an IDE. I'm a little less convinced that it can take fuzzy requirements and turn it into production code. Gathering crisp requirements at sufficient levels of detail to handle all corner cases and failure cases is essentially coding. It doesn't matter if you're expressing that in plain English versus the English of a programming language. It's kind of the same thing. But the real reason I'm not as worried about AI taking over our jobs is that as of now, these things don't know if they're wrong. Large language models are doing fancy pattern matching based on training data. There's no guarantee what they're trained on is correct, and there's no guarantee that they've seen the problem that I need help with. If your code base has over 100,000 lines of code spread out over a dozen microservices, I have doubts it's gonna be able to identify and fix a bug in production. Once it can do something like that, I'll be scared. In the meantime, making us more efficient is welcome and quite a step change in terms of the history of software development, but I have doubts about whether this is a new era sans software engineers. Bum asks, what are your thoughts on terminal career levels for most software engineers? Is never moving beyond senior software engineer ideal for a compensation relative to work responsibility? You don't care about corporate ladder climbing. I'm a big fan of working backwards from the lifestyle you want for your life. If you want a good work-life balance to minimize stress and to have enough money, it sounds like you're a Gucci. Is that what the kids say nowadays? Don't push for more if you don't need or want more. Senior is totally a terminal career level. What I would say is that life changes fast though. You said you were six years into your career. So let's assume you're a little under 30. When I was 30, I was pretty ambitious, but I was single with no kids without a mortgage. The idea of starting a family was pretty far out there. The second thing I'll say is that a senior engineer title is a really wide band. Some small places will give out big titles as a retention tool. Some places it's closer to a staff title. 130K fully remote is a pretty nice salary, but you can do three times better or more if you're in the States with potentially similar work-life balance. Don't stop growing and cultivating your skills. With three X your salary, you can retire so much faster. Then do whatever you want with your life. Gotham asks, do you ever consider leaving Amazon to join a startup as an early employee or found a startup on your own? Or was the steady and big paycheck of a Fang company too big to turn down, especially as you clamped up to senior and beyond? Okay. I've always thought about it like this, but I suppose I'm risk averse. If you look at the numbers for startups, most don't end up with an outsized payout. They're most likely to end up lower or at the steady corporate jobs level. So the only reason to do it are to gain a wide range of experience, or if you want to take a shot at 10xing your salary, which essentially cannot happen with a regular corporate job. If you value gaining a wide range of experience, a startup may be for you. Depending on the size of the company, you may be a coder, manager, marketer, IT specialist and customer support. You have to put on a lot of hats. It's likely to be a fast paced environment and your impact on the company is gonna be felt no matter what. I will say that big corporate gigs, especially fan companies, have an upside that people tend not to appreciate, which is that big companies software usually affects more users worldwide and will typically have bigger and more robust systems. So generally, the focus on quality is non-zero at big companies. And from what I've heard, when you go from a big shop to a small shop, people are often shocked by the decrease in quality of the code bases. Abu Bakar Muhammad asks, what are the biggest sacrifices you feel you've made to reach your level of success? Okay, uh, that question kind of cuts deep. In college, I used to buy a pass for a local resort and snowboard like 50 times a year. 
A lot of my friends were snow bums for a couple of years outside of school, but I started the career grind as early as I could. I can finally afford really nice gear and to fly out to find good snow, but I don't have the time anymore. My heritage is Chinese and Vietnamese, but I grew up in America. I have a bit of each of the languages, but sometimes I dream about being immersed there for six months or more, getting to know my roots. The longest vacation I've ever taken is four weeks, and the most time I've ever taken off of work is six weeks when my daughter was born. That was a really special time, but there's no way to construe that as time off. So to answer your question, I'm successful, but I'm time poor. With my family, my job, and the YouTube channel. You can do anything you want in this life, but you can't do everything. But hey, my priorities aren't set in stone, and life changes fast. Maybe I'll get to be a ski bum later in my life. Who knows? Isuru Nana Yakara asks, Hey Steve, what if you can't relate to the problems the mentee brings, or you simply don't know a solid answer? What should you say to them? The simple answer is to let them know that you can't relate to their problems and you can't really help them. So let them know that. I think the worst thing that you can do is make something up. There's a thing called the fallacy of false authority, and I see it all the time in software for some reason. The idea is that when someone is an expert in one field, it doesn't imply that they're an expert in another field. If someone's a neurosurgeon, that does not make them more qualified to be president. If someone's a principal software engineer, it doesn't make them qualified to give dating and relationship advice. Make sure as you progress in your career, you avoid that fallacy of false authority. Paris Walters asks, what's your advice on getting projects that will move a mid-engineer to senior? I'm feeling stuck. So one anti-pattern that I've noticed is that people feel like they need to be assigned a project of perfect scope to be promoted. There's some truth to that. It seems like an easy way to demonstrate that you're operating at the next level. The downside though, is that very rarely are projects perfectly sized. If the project's too big, it may require the work of many people and your contribution may be harder to demonstrate. Projects may launch a year later than when you wanna get promoted. They can also be canceled or you may get reorganized and may be taken off a project. So tying your promotion to a project means that your promotion gets tied to externalities. If there are projects that are senior engineer sized, you can hitch your wagon to them. But if there aren't, that doesn't mean you can't get promoted. There are no small parts, just small actors. I think that the way you deliver can be a strong indicator that you're operating at the next level. Perhaps you found a way to tweak a process to deliver faster. Perhaps in the course of writing some code, you determined that a refactor would have a ton of benefits, not just to the project, but to the existing production code. Perhaps you've been taking the time to uplevel your coworkers on a piece of technology you're an expert on. A thought experiment that may help is to think about what a senior engineer would do if they were assigned your work and then do that. This will get you promoted faster than getting assigned a big project. If you don't know what that is, make it your job to figure out. Not an NPC asks, Steve, what would you do? I'm 26 and making 125K as a software engineer in a non-tech Fortune 500 company, and I'm a high performer on my team. I never got my degree, but my job has incredibly easy hours and I believe I can do a full-time degree at the same time. Is it worthwhile to stay here and work on my degree or it would be better to focus on my career? I wanna work with the smart people in this industry and I feel my lack of education is holding me back. Okay, not an NPC. I can't make this choice for you. What I will say is that there is a declining focus on credentialism in our field. At my current company, we've changed the qualification criteria from a university degree to be inclusive of things like boot camps or equivalent industry experience. So if you have the skills and experience, you've got the goods. Really, the best education is working alongside awesome people and soaking in everything they have to teach you. My advice is to go back to school only if you'll regret dying without a university degree or the company that you want to work for has this as a minimum qualification. Otherwise, everything you can learn in school, you can learn outside of school. So suppose it will take you 15 hours a week for two years to get your degree. Let's say that's like 1500 hours. If you use half of that time by focusing on getting better with in-demand skills while on the job, you won't have any problems working wherever you want to. But you do you, man. Isuru Nana Yakara. Hey, Isuru again. Isuru asks, Hey Steve, love your content. One question. In our industry, you hear a lot about learning on your own time, simply because there's not enough time to learn on the job and or the job won't pay you to do so. How do you keep your knowledge up to date slash experiment and learn new things. So there's two categories of learning, stuff that's related to your day-to-day -day job and stuff that isn't. If it's related to your day-to-day -day job and you're not a contractor, make sure to learn on company time. If you are a contractor or consultant, companies paying you for a specific job, so it's not fair to cut into those billable hours with learning. But if you're a full-time employee and you're a software developer, it's totally appropriate to use company time to grow your skills. Part of my job is to stay abreast of the latest technologies because software engineers that I support will often ask about whether new technologies are appropriate for their projects. Either way though, if learning is part of your job or not, 
there's this concept of paying yourself first. With money, paying yourself first means saving and investing the first part of the paycheck before expenses. With time, paying yourself first means using the first hour or two of the day to do what you want to do. At least for me, I'm the most productive and receptive to learning the first thing in the morning. So I'll front load things like learning and growing my skills. If it's related to my work, it can be done on the clock. If it's not related to work, then it's off the clock. Either way, the best hours of my day go to what I want to do and learn, and the other hours, which are still good hours, just not the best, can go to my employer. If there's an overlap here, that's much the better. Which brings me to today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Lifelong learning is really important for me. I want to go where my curiosity takes me, and I want to be efficient with my time. Brilliant is the best way to learn math science and computer science interactively. Passive reading is the worst way to learn something. It gives you a false sense that you understand things deeply. I'm interested in so many things, but I have really limited time. So it's important to engage with the content to be efficient, even when doing hobby learning. For example, I didn't do enough statistics in school, but it's crazy useful to my day-to-day -day work. I use Brilliant to brush up on my stats with their quizzes and interactive features. I had the confidence to use statistical terms correctly in conversations with people that have PhDs in the subject. Brilliant has lessons on everything, with new ones added every month. One that caught my eye is the course on contest math. I always wanted to do math competitions when I was younger, but never had the opportunity. The course is super fun and I'm having a blast. To try everything Brilliant has to offer, free, for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash alifeengineered or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. If you've enjoyed today's office hours, here's a link to my previous sessions. If you have a question you'd like answered, leave it in the comment section below. Hope you have an excellent day.